All right, fellas, welcome along to the vlog. That is a little bit of homemade beef jerky with some, uh, uh, what's it called, naga, naga chili. Dangerously hot. I'm not going to have one while I'm talking to the camera because that will uh, that will kill me. So what have I come down for today? Well, I've been out this morning with the doggos and uh, I've been at home putting some herbs in the garden and stuff like that. And uh, I've been doing some research on how to heat these tanks in the winter. I know it's totally the wrong time of year now, uh, but it's just got me thinking watching Andy's video from Four Priests. And he's struggling to maintain temperature, fermented fermentation temperature in his brewery or on his beers, the first beers that he's done. And um, oh, it just got me revisiting the subject, to be honest. And I thought about a lot of different ways of doing that, and uh, not all of them have panned out. And at the moment, we've got like heating blankets, just your ordinary bedroom, you know, under blanket to heat most of these. And then one of them has got some underfloor heat mat cabling about uh, 300 watts worth of it and that's the only tank that actually performs I did actually order some other things which I trialed out but it wasn't successful so one of those other things I think is in here in one of these drawers there it is look so I thought this might work but it didn't and I'm not sure whether that is because I ordered it from China and they've sent the wrong spec stuff out. Oh, I'm not going to get in there, that's tight. So this is called um, silicon heat mat or silicon, silicon heating mat. There we go, there's a shot at it. The fact that it's got 3M adhesive on the back kind of says that it's not a dodgy one, but it was from China, direct from China, and when I initially trialled this, I bought two of them. I took the sticky backing off, I stuck it to a piece of stainless steel, and I plugged it into my Cliff Quick Test and powered it up. And the whole thing basically set on fire within about 30 seconds. So this was meant to be a 300 watt, uh, 220 volt heat map. And I thought, well, probably too high a watt density but if the concept works then we could do it properly stick that to your tank get a low watt density one so you've got maybe a patch of this stuff as big as maybe the bed of the table saw there and use that to maintain the temperature in the tank so you can buy these kind of things which have a watt density of around 2.5 watts per square inch. If I do some calculations, we'll be able to figure out exactly what the wattage of this bad boy is by measuring its resistance and determining how much uh, energy it's going to give off on our voltage of 241 volts. And we'll be able to figure out if this was indeed a 300 watt unit or not. In fact, I might just do that now. So if we bring in the heating pad and we just measure it up a little bit, it's uh, 6 inches by 4, so heating pad, pad, it is 6 by 4 and that's 150 by 100 in millimetres, 6 by 4 in inches there and then we take a quick reading of the impedance so let's turn the multimeter on not sure if you can see it maybe if I put it in focus you can and we'll get the two leads on the end and just measure these bad boys and we've got 54 point, uh, 159.4 so 
159.4 ohms or upside down horseshoes so we can work out now what the actual wattage of this little beauty was so we're going to say that 240 volts is equal to and then I've just got a little calculator on my phone to do this so that is 361 watts or 1.5 amps and then if we figure out 6 by 4 6 times 4 to give us the area in inches and then divide that uh, divide 361 by that, that gives us 15 watts per square inch or alternatively 2.4 watts per centimeter squared so that beast <clears throat> was advertised correctly at 240 volts but obviously the power is way too high to be sticking onto a piece of metal so dissipation of 2.4 watts per centimetre square I mean that's not very big is it if you think about it let's just look, draw a, a centimetre on here it's going to be an absolute killer there we go so just in that little area we've got 2.4 watts being radiated out and that's a lot of energy over this little area so realistically we want something that's doing uh, kind of spending that energy of 300 watts over something maybe 12 by 24 inches to really bring that watt density down and then hopefully this one something like this would self-regulate under the insulation on the side of a tank obviously after testing never get hot enough to be an issue hopefully it just have a surface temperature of below 70 degrees centigrade and then we could just use that or a couple of these glued to the tank in certain positions maybe on the cone where you know the heat would rise into the rest of the tank from there and that would allow us to heat the tanks in the winter and not have to interfere with the glycol tanks which is gonna bring me back to one of the reasons why I've come down to the workshop in the first place and it wasn't really to do this it was because I've been talking to Andy about his glycol um, recirculation around his two fermenters and he's got a bit of an issue where they're stuck so I thought I'd come down here and I would have a look at what power my recirculation pumps are for my glycol system and then it occurred to me I've got one of those glycol baths which is out of commission at the moment and it needed a new motor fitting in it so kill two birds with one stone come down here have a look how big those pumps are that I've got and also maybe repair the one that needs looking at so I think these are the pumps that I'm replacing everything with and they're not very big but they've got some minerals ah there we go so 1500 litres per hour or 25 watts I'll straighten that sticker out there we go to give you an idea so that is sufficient to pump glycol around my 500 litre tanks I don't know what's going on with there we go I don't know what went wrong there I didn't want to, didn't want to focus at all so this is sufficient to pump um, the glycol around my 500 litre tanks and with a maxi 310 chiller it brings 500 litres of beer down to usually around six or seven degrees in the summertime no problem at all we can get lower in the winter down to four even zero if it's cold enough ambient but I tend not to push them that far the beer doesn't really need to get to that temperature anyway 
So I'm going to send a picture of that to Andy to see if he's got pumps that are of similar power. And then we'll have a look at what exactly we've got in the Maxi 310 chiller that crapped out on me recently. So the chiller I want to get to is behind FV2. It actually cools FV1, but if you can see behind the tanks, we've got like a shelf behind, and all the chillers have sat on the shelves behind each tank. Then they're piped up to where they need to go. So it can be a little bit tricky to get to them. I did design the thing to be able to just, you know, all the fermenters would just pull out, but we've since changed the layout a little bit and introduced quite a wide gap so we can get to the fittings on fermenter number four. And then that means that what I really need to do is pop another shelf under the staircase section here. And then the easiest way to access these chillers is just by whipping the screws out of the gantry and lifting the board up. See this was all extended. You can see where it started originally back there. So this extra bit of platform is new. So I think I'm just going to pop these boards up, pull them out of the way, and we'll have a look underneath and see if we can see if we can access them. Yes, I'm eating jerky. Mm -hmm. Well there we have it. All four of the chillers. I think the one on the end is the dud one. I'm not sure actually. I could have replaced the pump in situ and then of course I've got one over there under the pilot kit table which has got the label applicator on it at the moment. Yeah so I'm not sure which is which. I'll probably just take them all up and uh, I want to move that one from there to there and then I'll move them all forwards one if that gets me drift and that'll mean we've got a little bit more pipe work then you see to play with when we want to uh, when we want to take the tanks out so at, at the minute it's just a little bit tight that one's got loads of uh, slack on it but some of the others don't so I'll just juggle these a minute and uh, relocate them up I'm doing what I usually do again aren't I and uh, I'm working on it without getting the camera out which I'm a sod for so I've noticed that um, this is the little motor I've got in here same size as the other one uh, it says 1800 litres per hour the other one says 15 I've noticed there's obviously a fair bit of rust in the system probably come from a few uh, Jubilee clips that I've used in there but because there's a magnet a permanent magnet in this motor I can see that it's actually picked up a lot of the sludge but that's easily sorted I'll just go and give that a bit of a clean in a moment and then I thought you know I could probably reconfigure in here to make it a little neater so they usually come with these pipes like this and what happens is these two pipes poke through yonder hole there. They're what you terminate your fermenter onto, I guess, in this case. But they'd be your glycol out loop. And then this one goes on the pump. Again, just a bit of silicon hose to get me from A to B, really. And then this is the return. And I've just kind of hacked and attached things to it to make it work for the purposes of cooling the fermenters down but I suppose a lot of this stuff in here isn't really needed here you'll see we've got the um, thermo probe for the STC 1000 along the back there is the uh, condenser and this is the evaporator coil and also there's an overflow and then all these little holes here are where the coils went in and out for your product well basically all they do now is reduce the capacity of my tank so I've just filled them all up with a blob of silicon in fact I've just thought when I put the lid on it's going to get stuck so 
I'd probably do well to smooth them all over on the top as well just so they are where they should be that one on the end could probably do with a bit more that, that should do though that should do the trick it'll just stop glycon falling out when I'm slushing, slushing it backwards and forwards now I'd also say you know looking in here could do with a clean I really should kind of pump out the glycol and if I look at the bottom of the tank I can write my name in the gunk at the bottom of the tank but it is just a glycol bath after all how clean does it really need to be as long as it's not a corrosive environment we should be fine we are seeing a little bit of verdigris on these evaporator coils but nothing that I'm too concerned about and uh, it's always nice to open these because I can have a look then at the the compressor side of the thing and I am thinking about building my own glycol chiller um, getting a compressor um, using uh, instead of a condenser like this having it hooked up to a water bath and then having that water bath go outside to a heat dump I think it might work, I'm not too sure and then obviously a big evaporator coil in a, in a larger bath of refrigerant or glycol and um, yeah it's difficult to get hold of the refrigerant chemicals because you need to be F gas certified but a lot of the compressors that used to run on 134A will operate with um, propane so I think I might have a play with that even though it's a flammable gas which I'm used to playing around with I think you just need to take the correct precautions and uh, make sure you're not going to blow yourself up but I think that's a video for another day so at the moment I'm just going to determine how I want to rejig the lid so I'm doing a bit of thinking out loud here really aren't I so if I pass the pump back through there now this lid sits on top of the glycol tank not on top of the machine proper then it's got these holes in it for this would have been your original recirc pump and uh, well maybe that would have been the pump and this is for access into the tank and I don't really oh that's right that's right it goes on that way I believe and that was the that's where you fill the tank from and this was for the uh, for the recirc pump I don't want all those holes in there and everything like that so I'm trying to think of a way to redirect the pipe work but I'm probably just going to put it back in as it's come out to be fair it don't look like we've lost a lot of gly glycol I might give it a top up once I put it back into its new position but other than that, I just want to put it on the floor and clean out the evaporator coil. I'm probably going to just hose it out. I've already brushed it out, but it looks like there's a lot of gunk inside the uh, the condenser coil. Sorry, it looks like there's a lot of gunk inside the fins. So I might just blast that out with a hose pipe. But yeah, there we go. This is the inside of a Maxi 310 minus the product coils, which I removed a long time ago, mainly to make more room for glycol. So I decided to measure the concentration of the glycol in the chiller and we're sitting around 1025 which is around 20 percent 1025 on the uh, refractometer which yeah, as I say is around 20 percent glycol concentration and that means that it's about two liters in a 10 liter reservoir and this is not far off that I think it's 16 litres so I've got some spare glycol so what I'm going to do is just rinse everything out so this is the condenser coils here just giving them a spray out so them clean avoiding all the electrics of course the electrics are nowhere near this section. And 
And then I also wanted to rinse out the uh, reservoir section as well, but I didn't want to do that on top of that new bit of silicon that I've just put in. So I'm going to flip the whole thing the other way around. I just found a rubber foot there. So I'll probably just do this from this direction while I can. Gonna get to the back, you see. We go. That looks a heck of a lot better inside. Just checking I press record there because I couldn't quite remember. So if I chuck that pump in there, rotate the whole shebang around and take the pump back out and we'll tip it this way there we go so we've got an unreadable um, sticker on the back so that's no help to me I'll pop that there and then also looking at the angle that we've got there there's something just poking out that's not going to drain completely so I'm just gonna have to put it at a little bit of a precarious angle like that make sure we're not putting any strain on that pipe and then I don't know if I'm still in shot I hope so I know I've moved off to the uh, to the left well, let's give it a go Obviously you wouldn't want to be turning your compressor back on. For the next 24 hours, maybe it's not so bad because I haven't tipped it upside down, upside down, upside down, but all the oil you see could potentially go into the low side of the compressor, which means that the compressor would be compressing liquid. And that's kind of a big no. They don't like compressing liquid. So it will It'll cap up the machine so it will give us a spray down so I'm not standing in spent by. And there we have it. Might just get a bit of tissue and clean the inside, but that is that. We're about ready to put it all back together. I decided to just run with the original fittings. No, I just couldn't be bothered. Let me just grab that uh, other foot. Well, these rubber feet don't quite do a lot for holding it in place as such, but they do prevent a rattling noise which can often occur when the corner of the pump is just hitting the plastic on the bottom somewhere and it can become a little bit annoying. Right, I'll slot these two back through there. But you know what? That is good enough. I'm going to send this under there there just so the uh, return is going in via a different pathway and then I have to try and find the hole 
I might have to just put some flour around it and wait for it to fart. Oh, no, got it. We're in. There we are. Every hole's a goal. Let me just nip that up. Oh, can you hear that? Maybe not. Somebody's just turned the extractor on that side. Right, and so we've got flow and return. I'm going to mark them up with blue for flow and red for return. I'm just going to do that with a bit of insulation tape. So finally the lid and the last couple of screws just to hold it in place. I put these in every time I take one of these apart and I always think to myself I should have left those screws out because I want to just quickly flick the top open and have a look at something usually which pipes which I've uh, negated that though with this little bit of clever colour coding and there we are that's now ready for service and we can move on to the next one I'm going to do exactly the same all the way down the line we've got a couple more to go and then the one on the end I'm pretty sure is not in use so that might that might be my spare look how wobbly that is you'd never know I'd been I've even swept well hosed down and uh, squeegeed the floor and I do love this floor you know it's fantastic it's just so easy to clean we've got all three fermenters back in place they've all had a quick refurb and they're all ready to go actually just let them settle for the rest of the weekend uh, oh, it's Sunday today actually so yeah we'll be in tomorrow but they won't be turned on we're not going to be brewing this week at least and we've got of course the brew tubers coming along for the Retford revisited meat so they're all coming to the brew shed to partake in some of our lovely lovely beers anyway ladies and gentlemen that's another vlog in the bag and uh, that's another Sunday where I've come in to ease the boredom we'll see you on the next one folks freaking rights